Good morning. Today is Wednesday, February the 13th, 2019. Happy day before Valentine's Day. We are beginning round six of the Georgia Book Award book battles. In round five, we read Dad and the Dinosaur and Strictly No Elephants. The winner was Strictly No Elephants. Today, two more books will square off. We'll be reading Sergeant Reckless by Patricia McCormick and The Rooster Who Would Not Be Quiet by Carmen Agra Didi. Let us begin with Reckless. The small red mare whinnied for her supper, but Korea was at war. Towns were shattered, fields were scorched, and the racetrack was abandoned. No one paid attention to the hungry little horse. Nearby, U.S. Marines were exhausted from hauling heavy ammunition uphill to a powerful new cannon nicknamed the Reckless Rifle. That's when their leader, Lieutenant Eric Peterson, had an idea. What if he could get a mule to carry the shells? But all Lieutenant Peterson could find was a scrawny Sorrel mare with a white blaze and three matching socks. She wasn't much, but she reminded him of a horse he'd had as a boy. So he took a chance on her. the base, as the Marines gathered around to meet the new recruit, Lieutenant Peterson realized he'd forgotten to buy hay. One of the men held out a piece of bread. The mare gobbled it up. Then she devoured the rest of the loaf. Another man offered her some oatmeal. She licked the bowl clean. She was pretty. The Marines agreed, but she was small. How could she carry such heavy ammunition? And how would she react when she heard the thunder of the cannon? A mule was slow and steady, but a racehorse was high strung and skittish. She'd have to go to special training and she'd start out at the same rank as any newbie, private, private reckless. Thing Private Reckless had to learn was to duck incoming fire, which meant that her trainer, Sergeant Joseph Latham, had to teach her to kneel down. First, he gave her a sugar cube every time he tapped her front leg, then another one when she knelt down. Before long, the greedy little horse knelt down the moment he tapped her leg. Reckless also had to learn to retreat. When Latham gave the command, she had to trot back to her bunker where another reward was waiting. An apple or chocolate candy bar or peanut butter sandwich, even a can of beans, whatever it was, Reckless would eat it. Next, Latham led her up the hill to the cannon with a little coaxing and a lot of chocolate. She'd soon follow Latham anywhere. Finally, she was fitted with a pack saddle, a paddled wooden cargo frame with leather straps across her chest and her legs. Unlike a racing saddle, it was big, bulky, and constricting. Latham cinched up the girth and the men stood back, expecting her to try to throw it off. Reckless just stood there. They loaded ammunition shells onto her pack and waited for her to buck, but she just put her head down and marched up that hill. Her reward that day was an ice cold Coca-Cola.
By now, Reckless thought of herself as a member of the company and was free to roam the camp. One morning, she showed up at the mess hall where the cook gave her an apple. She nudged his shoulder for more, so he offered her scrambled eggs and toast. From then on, she ate the same breakfast as the men and washed it down with a cup of coffee. After she figured out which bunk belonged to the cook, she'd, she'd clip-clop into his tent at daybreak and lick his face until he woke up and served her breakfast. The men began looking forward to seeing the little horse with the big appetite when they went to Chow Hall. They had come to love her, but deep down they worried that when it came to the real battle, she might not have what it takes. One day, the Marines spotted enemy troops approaching. Instantly, they went into battle mode. Private Monroe Coleman saddled up Reckless and led her up to the top of the hill. Boom! Just as they were delivering their load, the cannon went off. A blast of hot air sent dust and gravel flying toward the horse. Reckless jumped straight in the air, even with six shells on her back. Easy, girl, Coleman said, stroking her mane. Boom! The cannon roared again. She jumped, but not high, not so high this time. Boom! This time, Reckless just snorted. By the next time the gun went off, Reckless was busy eating the helmet liner she'd found in the grass. From then on, Reckless was one of the guys. On cold nights, she snuck into Latham's tent and slept on the floor. And when the men played poker, she joined in. One night, she'd eaten about $30 worth of poker chips before they caught on. Reckless served in more skirmishes. But her most dangerous assignment came at the Battle of the Outpost Vegas. That night, the men awoke to shells and white-hot flares falling right inside the base. Reckless trotted back to her bunker, trembling. And for the first time, she refused to eat. But the minute she was loaded with her pack, Reckless got to work. At the base of the path, she took a deep breath, pricked her ears forward, and she charged the hill. Without a word or of urging, she broke into a trot and then a gallop. The heavy shells banged against her sides as she hit the steep incline. The first rays of dawn were lighting the sky as she arrived at the top of the trail, her flanks heaving. The sky was full of smoke. Shells whizzed by and cannons boomed. All day, Reckless marched up and down the windy path, hauling her load. As she passed her fellow Marines along the way, they gave her their chocolate bars to keep up her strength. Then a piece of shrapnel hit Reckless over her left eye. Blood trickled down onto her white blaze, but she kept going. Later, another piece of shrapnel hit her left flank. After a dab of iodine and a drink of water, she was back at work. Night fell as sizzling flares cast eerie shadows on the landscape. The Marines were beginning to tire, but they saw the little mare silhouette, silhouetted on the ridge, her head hanging as she put everything she had into her job. She was soaked in sweat, lather curling up over her saddle. When she came back down the hill, one by one, the men took off their body armor or jackets and laid them over her for protection. And by the end of the day, Reckless had made 51 trips 
gone the distance of 35 miles up and down steep terrain, carried 9,000 pounds of ammunition. The battle helped change the course of the war. At last, there was a ceasefire and Reckless was able to rest. The, me no, the Marines promoted Reckless to sergeant, and then they came one by one to say goodbye to the little mare, who'd shown as much heart on the battlefield as any man among them. When they got home, they started a campaign to bring Reckless to the United States. A ship owner agreed to pay her passage and the man took up a collection to buy her a beautiful scarlet and gold blanket with sergeant stripes. But by the time the boat arrived, Reckless had eaten her blanket, ribbons and all. Sergeant Reckless, the little mare who became a Marine, is the only animal to officially hold military rank. She received two purple hearts and retired with full military honors and the rank of staff sergeant. Her story is a testament to the mysterious bond between humans and animals and proof of the Marine Corps model. Motto, Simber Fi, Ever Faithful. The end. And that was Sergeant Reckless. Now, Let's talk about a rooster. The rooster who would not be quiet. Once there was a village where the streets rang with song from morning till night. Dogs bayed, mothers crooned, engines hummed, fountains warbled, and everybody sang in the shower. Everyone and everything had a song to sing. This made the village of La Paz a very noisy place. It was hard to hear. It was hard to sleep. It was hard to think. And no one knew what to do. So they fired the mayor. Now, they were a very noisy village without a mayor. So they held an election. Only Don Pepe promised peace and quiet. He won by a landslide. The next day, a very polite law appeared in the village square. No loud singing in public, por favor. Things were getting better already. But more laws soon followed. No loud singing at home. No loud singing. No singing. The noisy village of La Pa was silent as a tomb. Even the tea kettles were afraid to whistle. Some people left the village singing loudly. Others stayed behind and learned to hum. The rest were just grateful to have good night's sleep, crying out loud. Seven very quiet years passed, and then one evening, a saucy Gilio and his family wandered into the village and roosted in a fragrant mango tree. And when the little rooster awoke the next morning, he did what roosters were born to do. He sang, Kiki Rip Kiki! As his rotten luck would have it, the mango tree grew beneath the cranky mayor's window. Uh-oh. You there, growled Don Pepe. No singing, it's the law. Well, 
That's a silly law, said the merry Galito. Smell this sweet mango tree. How can I keep from singing? Then I'll chop down that stinky tree, huffed Don Pepe. Will you sing then? The plucky Galito shrugged. I may sing a less cheerful song, but I will sing. And he did. Still singing, snapped on Pepe. You have a, you have no tree, remember? I have no tree, said the Galito. But I have my hen and chicks. How can I keep from singing? Will you sing if I throw you in a cage alone, threatened Don Pepe? I may sing a lonelier song, said the stubborn Galito. But I will sing. And he did. Don Pepe. You have no hen and chicks. No hen and chicks? The Galito sighed. But I still have corn tea. How can I how can I keep from singing? And if you have no more corn, asked the mayor. I may sing a hungrier song, said the headstrong Galito, but I will sing. And he did. you hungry, you crazy bird? Well, Don Pepe. Of course, said the Galito. But if the sun can still shine despite the world's troubles, how can I keep from singing? And if you never see the sun again, snarled the mayor. And he ran for a blanket to cover the rooster's cage. I may sing a darker song, the brave Galito called after him. But I will sing. And he did. Kiki, Rikiki. As the Galito song echoed down the soundless streets of La Pa, it stirred an old, familiar longing for a time when everyone and everything had a song to sing. Kiki, Rikiki, Kiki, Rikiki. Oh, not so with Don Pepe. Singing gave him indigestion. The next day, Don Pepe stumbled out of the out to the yard in his nightshirt. He tore away the blanket and pleaded, "You have no tree to roost in, no hen and chicks to comfort you, no grain to fill your belly, nor sun to drive away the shadows." Why, oh, why are you still singing? Promise to stop and I will set you free. One by one, a quiet crowd began to gather in Don Pepe's yard. I sing for those who dare not sing or have forgotten how, said the Galito. If I must sing for them as well, senor. How can I keep from singing? And if I have, and if I have you made into soup, the mayor hunt thundered. I suppose you will still sing if you were dead. Oh. The entire village held its breath waiting for the Galito's reply. Dead roosters sing no songs. He said, ha, crow Don Pepe. Sure, he had won.
bud. A song is louder than one noisy little rooster and stronger than one belly, oh, excuse me, but a song is louder than one noisy little rooster and stronger than one bully of a mayor, said the Galito, and it will never die. So as long as there is someone to sing it, And there was. Once again, there was a village where the streets rang with song from morning till night. This made for a very noisy place to live. And that's just the way everyone wanted it. The end. The rooster who would not be quiet. So today we had two books about two animals who made a difference. So I can't wait to see how your votes turn out. Thank you for listening and have a good day.